Gustavo, you're so welcome to the Happier Work podcast. I know we had a conversation a few months ago, so I'm really excited to to dive in and continue that conversation at uh, this time, actually recording what we're saying, a uh, slightly different approach this time, but uh, really excited to have you on the podcast. Do you want to introduce yourself, give people a little bit of a flavor of your background and how you got into doing what you're doing today? Absolutely. And thank you for hosting me. I mean, the, f the first thing that like, um, when we tell our story, we usually tell it in a structured way that feels, oh, everything was planned. But I think that in my story, like many others, it's uh, a little bit of based on different emotions, different changes. And mine, usually it's about frustration. That's what made me build in different instances uh, and why I changed career. And I worked for over two decades in the marketing and innovation world helping companies come up with better solutions, better ideas, be more creative. And at some point, once again, out of frustration, I realized that it's not a lack of ideas or talent what's holding innovation and creativity in many companies, but it's actually their culture. So I say, well, uh, um, organically, I was helping some of my clients. They didn't come to me or my companies, my previous employers to, to work on culture. But in the end, we always ended up discussing that and say, hey, what if I pivot? What if I shift and start helping them in that area? Because if we don't have a conducive culture, all the talent that people are bringing to, to the workplace, all the ideas that are being discussed, both organic or ideas that consultants, like I used to be, bring to a the table, they're never going to see the light of day. So that's basically what made me uh, find my new path. <laughs> it's so interesting that you say that. Um, I kind of can slightly relate coming from an agency background where we used to present our ideas all the time to our clients you know we worked with with huge global clients as well as smaller local clients in fast moving consumer goods so the likes of unilever coca-cola maybe they're the ones that people are most familiar with um but we would present these recommendations based on data and exactly like you say gustavo maybe they will never see the light of day you know and uh it's a little bit frustrating when you put your heart and soul into making these recommendations to someone and then they just don't go anywhere. Now, from an agency perspective, perhaps that's because we weren't so ingrained in the business. That's a conversation for another day completely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and how to kind of become that trusted partner as opposed to um, mm -hmm. kind of the, the extra pair of hands like normally gets hired from an agency perspective. Um, but what are the, the, the kind of big challenges that you're seeing out there with organizations at the moment, in, whether it's in relation to innovation, culture? Yeah, I think the, the, there are many common themes. Uh, the biggest one that I hear from employees a lot. So in my line of work, I do a lot of consulting, but then I do a lot of uh, training. We have programs. So we have people that join us in either a scenario and they share the things that they wouldn't share with your managers, right? Yes. And the biggest thing, it's the gap between what leaders say they want from their teams, from their culture, and what the decisions that they make actually tell people. So for example, they say, I want a culture of collaboration, but then they are the first that don't promote collaboration or they reward by promoting someone who is the least collaborative team member. They say that they want innovation, but then when people are trying to get funding or time to innovate or they're trying to make risk or they make a mistake, mm. boom, they get punished by that. So in the end, that huge gap is what frustrates people. No? So either you need to align your action your words with your actions and say yeah. stop saying what that you want to innovate if, if you're really not willing to take the risk or experiment or maybe open up your mind and and, and create a culture that it rewards for example mistakes not every mistakes mm. i'm not talking about stupid mistakes but those that happen when you're learning to do something for the first time when you're experimenting new paths new technology things that no one has done before and of course you're going to fail until you crack it Mm, yeah, yeah. I love that approach and really insightful. I'd say I certainly can relate to that from my corporate experience. And I'm sure there's a lot of people listening today who can absolutely relate to that, that on the one hand, they're saying this one thing, but they're not actually backing that up with their actions. So they're saying one thing, but they're not leading the way by example. What would you say is the kind of the first step to changing that kind of behavior? There are two elements. One is a increasing self-awareness. So Dr. Tasha Urich, she did a lot of research. She actually wrote a couple of books 
on self-awareness. And one of the things that she uncovered is that most of us believe that we are self-aware, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Close yeah, to yeah. 75%. <laughs> but actually, a very tiny percentage, close to 10, 15, really know ourselves really well. The problem is when that comes to leaders and especially male leaders, the numbers, the people that believe, hey, I'm self-aware goes to a roof over 90. <laughs> but the ones who are actually self-aware go down to the basement if you want okay. 5%. Yeah. So if you as a leader, with all due respect, are not self-aware, you don't see what you don't know, you don't understand your blind spots, you don't get feedback from other people to understand what you're missing, then you're going to be making lots of assumptions. You're going to be making lots of mistakes and making decisions without the right information. And that's a critical point to understand mm -hmm. that many times uh, it's not about finger pointings, but usually the leader is the problem. No, So leaders are the ones who define the culture, who shape culture. They're not the only ones, people too. But if the leader is basically the problem, how can you improve a culture if you don't start working with the leader? Yeah. The second element is our relationship with fear. Uh, and that's why our company is called Fearless. Fearless doesn't mean the absence of fear. No, fear is an emotion. We need it uh, when you're going to get into uncharted waters or you're going to cross the street. Fear is that signal that tells you, hey, watch out to both sides because something might happen. Mm -hmm. However, when we are in a fearful environment that we're driven by fear, so we cannot connect with the fear, we cannot uh, deal with it, then we let fear of making mistakes, the fear of pissing someone off, the, the fear of uh, the red tape, of uh, saying something that your manager wouldn't accept or wouldn't agree with, then that makes people like a uh, self-censor and they keep their best ideas, they keep their best questions to uh, for themselves, to themselves. That's a pick up on this idea of self awareness again, and I can totally relate to this idea. This idea that I think everyone likes to believe that they're totally self aware, um, and you know, and I, I suppose I'm thinking about from the point of view of a leader, and you know, this is a, a topic that has come up again and again on the podcast. Like it's for me, it's a critical skill to have if you are a leader. And one of my previous guests says said that there is. Um, in relation to self-awareness, when we think we're, we're so, so self-aware, but actually it's part of that is understanding what our impact is on others. And you can't grow in self-awareness just by going into your own mind. You have to actually get feedback and, and develop your self-awareness from that. And I suppose for any leaders listening today, if they're, you know, I suppose there, there's a couple of different ways to look at this. They might be feeling a bit like if, I am so self-aware, but I haven't actually asked for any feedback. So how do I go about asking for feedback to get, to build up that level of self-awareness? And then, you know, how do we continue to develop that? Interesting statistic, by the way, that leaders, the number of perceived or perception of self-awareness increases massively. And then suddenly it comes down, you know, for the actual self-awareness that people have. I'd be curious to know. And I, I, I'm a big fan of, of uh, Dr. Tasha, so I'll definitely check out that, that, uh, that research that she's done. Sure. I'm glad to send you the link afterwards. The, the, you mentioned something that's really important, which is feedback. And, and the point is, what do we mean by feedback? Usually when I... I, we do a lot of training and, and, and coaching and, and workshop with clients on feedback. And usually feedback equals to a performance review. And feedback is much more than that. Feedback can be to your point, you're presenting an idea to your client and how the client gives you feedback. No judgment, not I like it, I don't like it, but hey, what about this? Sometimes feedback can come in the, this, the form of questions. Sometimes feedback can come in the source of a, a maybe help the person that's stuck reflect on their situation. So if an employee is not doing great, maybe the feedback is not telling them what they need to improve, but it's more about helping them first realize that something's going wrong, mm -hmm. but also what's going on? Because we don't know the context. We don't know if the person's going through some personal issues. We don't know there's some context within their team members that's not helping that person thrive, or maybe they're in the, role, in the wrong role. Google has done a lot of experiments in which by changing one employee from a team to another, their performance improved exponentially. So sometimes we need to focus more on feedback in terms of the context, not just only on the individual. 
Also, feedback shouldn't be a fixing tool. It should be a tool for learning and growth. And to your point, one practice that works really, really work to build a culture of feedback is to have managers ask for feedback, to request feedback rather than giving. Patagonia started this many years ago in which leaders no longer give feedback, but actually expected to ask for feedback. So when they ask for feedback, not only they get to see their blind spots, but also they send the message, hi, if my leader is open to receive feedback, if they realize that they're not perfect, if they're willing to go through that painful experience of realizing that they need to get better, well, I'm going to do the same. So it kind of creates a, a contagious kind of a, a positive vicious, a, no, a virtuous cycle in which everyone a, a starts asking for feedback. Brilliant. Love that. And um, I love this idea that it's, I mean, I always think of feedback as a, as a gift. Now, it, it, I think when a lot of people hear the term feedback, it puts a shiver down their spine because it's always associated with exactly like I say, performance review, getting constructive feedback or negative feedback. And I think we tend to focus on that rather than the positive reinforcement of this is what you're doing really, really well. I love the idea of being able to identify blind spots as well for people that maybe they didn't realize they have and then leaders as role models. So if my leader is asking for feedback, then maybe it's okay if I ask others for feedback as well in order to help me improve um, because I don't have all the answers. And it shows to me a level of vulnerability as well when when leaders do that, you know, that it's it gives other people permission to be able to be vulnerable at work, to, to admit that they don't have all the answers, that there are areas where they can improve in. Definitely. And, and the building on the metaphor, and we always said feedback is a gift. So it, when people see the, the box, they say, oh, what's this? I'm going to like it. They're already like a, resisting it. But if it comes from your to your point, from a place of uh, vulnerability, if it comes from a place of empathy, then the gift is always going to be helpful. Even if you don't like it, you know, that's mm -hmm. the point with feedback. It's an opinion. Feedback is not the uh, true. When you're giving feedback, the same way when you choose a gift for someone, it's your best guess that something that that person either needs that or they're going to like it, or it's based on something they mentioned to you. Mm -hmm. But it's not the truth. So as a giver, never assume that because you choose the gift that you're right. It just, yeah. hey, this is on the other end of the spectrum. If you're the receiver, always assume good and positive intent. Mm -hmm. Assume that the person wants to give you something out of a good a vulnerability, out of empathy, out of a, 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 a being good to you and what they see out of you. And always be thankful, always say thank you, even if you decide that you're not going to choose that feedback. Mm. That's something important and both givers and receivers need to understand the feedback that we get is not mandatory. It's just a gift and we can choose to use it or not. Yeah, really, really interesting points there. And I think it ties in with this idea um, that you mentioned about Google and the context of the situation that you find yourself in. Maybe we'll come back to that in a minute. I just wanted to illustrate and, and I, I suppose put home this idea that feedback is an opinion. It's one person's opinion. And, you know, if that's coming from someone who you don't necessarily get along with, maybe you don't assume positive intent. I think it is really important to assume that the outcome that both parties want is improved performance of the individual who is receiving the feedback If it, in this constructive feedback situation, let's say that it, it benefits both sides to, in, if that person improves their work performance and looking at what the outcome that both people want from this. But I also love that you say that opinion, it's, it's, you don't have to take it on board. So you can listen to feedback from lots and lots of different people, but you get to decide what you're actually going to implement and what changes you're going to make as a result as well. Yeah, and I think one, one aspect that people can incorporate to a process is asking a very simple question, which is, what kind of help do you need? So if I go to see my boss and my manager and share, hey, I have this issue, people immediately, managers and sometimes colleagues too, jump into what I call the fixing mode. Mm, they think, yeah. oh, this person is broken. They have an issue. I'm the hero. I'm going to tell them how they need to improve that behavior. Many times people come to us simply because they need to, not only, I wouldn't say bent, but it, because it's not complete. They want to get something out of the system. Sometimes people, they need someone to listen to them, to empathize, to, hey, I'm here to help you, support you, I get it. 
sometimes when you talk, you get to clarify your ideas when you're like a mm. bouncing some thoughts with someone else. Sometimes you need people to help you clarify thoughts. Questions are better than solutions to help people clarify what they're going through. And maybe people need a solution or maybe ideas, not the solution. Mm. Or maybe they have ideas, but they need someone to validate them or someone to mm. help them clarify those ideas or maybe add additional ones. So that's very important that feedback is not just about providing the solution, which is the other thing that we need to correct. Feedback is about helping people. So mm. ask what help do you need before yeah. you provide that help? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's taking that coaching approach where you're asking rather than providing the solution. You're not telling people what to do. You're asking coaching, probing questions to help someone, to help them to get to their own answer. And I know certainly when people have taken that approach to me in a corporate environment, it's really made me feel empowered that I can actually do this myself. I mm -hmm. absolutely gave credit to the coach who helped me with that situation, <laughs> but at the same time felt really, really empowered that I had the answers inside me the, the entire time, you know? So I think taking that approach is really, really, um, it's really, really beneficial. I would love to come back to the Google research that you were saying. So they take an individual and put them into a different team and their performance just was exponential you know i i haven't heard that of that research before so i'd love to know a little bit more about it yeah there are many studies about that but in the end i mean and of course people are going to say hey you work on culture so of course you're going to push but it's it most performance issues are the result of a system not of the individual of course there's that doesn't mean that people are never going to be wrong or not but before jumping into the conclusion that we need to fix the individual, get back to understand what's going on with the system. So one tool that we use a lot and companies like Etsy and Google and many others, uh, Atlassian software company use, it's called the bl blameless postmortem. We develop a framework for that, our own approach to do it, and it's available for free for everyone who wants to download it. It, the point I want to blame this postmortem, it's that it helps people when something went wrong. You know, there were a prog issue, someone screwed up, we missed a huge deadline or, I don't know, whatever the, the problem was, is to reflect not, without blaming people, without finding, hey, who screwed up, but actually try to understand what was in the system that make it easier for people to screw up. Were there certain signals? Do we lack a clear communication protocol? Is there something in the technology that's not helpful? So that's in the end, the performance mistakes, eh, problems usually are the result of a system. So what we need to understand is not, hey, this person is broken, but what about the system that had encouraged or promoted or make it easier or maybe push people in that direction? So then we had a huge mistake or a problem. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely love that 100% behind that. And I think the tendency, um, I know certainly in organizations that I've worked in in the past, the tendency has been to look for the person to blame, um, to to find the scapegoat to, you know, and um, one of the organizations that I worked in was a very openly cover your arse, as we said, um, <laughs> kind of scenario. <laughs> yeah, because it's like you want to make sure you have everything in writing because what if something goes wrong? You want to make sure that you're covered, that you did everything that you could, you know. Um, and it's 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 really a shame because when we start looking and blaming people, that impacts on the culture. It brings morale down. But when it's, when it's kind of a no-fault thing and let's look at, well, what set of circumstances actually led to this thing going wrong and what do we need to do differently next time? So kind of forward-focused rather than past, how do we make sure that this doesn't happen again? Absolutely. And once again, when you're looking for the scapegoat, you know, I mean, that in the, the Asian people used to do that. You know, they kill the goat, they blame it to someone and then, oh, the problem magically is going to go away. But it didn't and it won't in your company. So blame, I mean, and even if one person really screwed up, there's still something behind that person mm -hmm. that was... <laughs> whatever the but there's something to use. be learned I, I just, by, 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 by my tongue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's always something to be learned so don't rush into the 
finding them like the 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 witches of Salem. No, there's always something that we need to burn, yeah. and we think that the issues are going to go away. That's something yeah. that has been part of our human instinct because it's a self-preservation because we don't want to admit that maybe we are part of the problem and that's the issue no? so yeah. uh, we talk about leaders we talk about culture uh, we need we all need to self-reflect rather than simply put all the burden in one individual or two mm -hmm. yeah this is it and kind of going back to your earlier point gustavo it's it relates to this entire culture of not admitting mistakes and therefore not opening your mouth, not asking the right questions, not sharing your ideas because you're afraid if things go wrong that you will be that scapegoat and it really hampers innovation. You know, I've certainly been in that situation where you're kind of afraid to say anything. So you just don't say anything at all. And if you do make a mistake, you want to make sure that that mistake is covered up. And if it's covered up, then it, you know, it happens again. This is the thing. Yeah, I talk about that companies are mistake intolerant. So <laughs> similar, like if you're a lactose intolerant and your system rejects a particular or other <laughs> food, no? and it creates from allergy to more serious kind of reactions, the same happens with the company because the system starts to react in a weird a, a, a way. And I think it's important to understand, like usually I ask clients, what's your mistake policy? And they look uh. at me like, what? You need to clarify and codify how you deal with mistakes, which mistakes are okay, which are not, how you're going to react. Because it, it's a, 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 a territory that's open for interpretation and then it creates a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have a clear mistake policy which codifies how we're going to react, how we're going to deal with mistakes, how we're going to improve, how we're going to share them in the open so we can learn. Mm -hmm. When people are afraid or they're mistake intolerant, the system, because it rejects that kind of issues, people are going to hide mistakes under the rug. Yeah. Not only you're going to find too late, if there's something that you know, a mistake can be, if you find easier or quickly, you can fix it before it becomes a, becomes a bigger problem. But actually people, if you don't share them in the open, people are going to start repeating the same mistakes. So you're not correcting the system. You're mm -hmm. just encouraging individuals to hide their mistakes. Absolutely, 100%. So this, the kind of second element that we spoke about is this idea of the, the relationship with fear. Now that's something that comes up. I talk about imposter syndrome a lot. So fear is kind of one of the, the things associated with imposter syndrome, fear of judgment, fear of success, fear of failure, all of these different things. Um, what kind of things do you see coming up specifically in relation to fear in organizations? Like how does that manifest itself? There, are, um, of course, the fear of speaking up, and I can talk about mm. that, which is the most common and lack of psychological safety and how it affects, mm. you know, it, it promotes groupthink, it promotes people to even toxic cultures, because when people stop, it stop talking, uh, and then they allow bad behaviors to become part of the culture. But one element that's really, really important uh, regarding fear um and I lost my line of thinking. Give me a second if you don't mind. No problem. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and, well, my God. Um, where was it? Uh. Where I was, was this fear of speaking up, no psychological safety and allowing bad behavior to be a part of the culture because people aren't speaking up. They're tolerating it, essentially. Yeah, I, I got it. The other point I want to make is the pretending that we are working. So the fear is the one of the biggest fear that we are seeing is that people need to show that they are busy in order to be perceived as a good employee, as a productive employee, because we are still confusing the hours that we put, the effort that we put as signs of productivity rather than focusing on the outcome. So before the pandemic, we saw a lot of people that were, you know, the rule never be the the last to arrive to the office yeah. neither nor the 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 first to leave mm. because the more hours you you spend at the desk well your manager would see oh i office a very hard working woman i like her she's a great employee that's the kind of a mentality a fast forward we went through a pandemic now in a hybrid environment and we're seeing what's called virtual presentism so the remote mm. version of that in which people are spending close to an hour per day 
that means like it's we're talking about 20 hours per month or even mm -hmm. more pretending that they're working so i'm going to clarify this for the audience i'm not talking about the people who slack i'm talking about highly committed highly engaged employees that feel the pressure not only from their managers but from their colleagues as well to show hey i'm busy so they create useless meetings they send calendar invites they send emails message on slack in different hours to simply show hey i'm working i'm not slacking i'm not playing i don't know video mm -hmm. games or playing with my family and that's really bad that shows the culture a culture of fear mm -hmm. in which people need to be busy to be accepted and be respected as a high performance uh, employee wow and yeah, I mean, I was going to kind of dive into that a little bit more detail because that's it's pretty shocking. But at the same time, I can relate to it, especially having worked in offices where presenteeism, presenteeism is absolutely valued. And I remember there's an old saying of like, don't don't leave before the boss. So if the boss is still in their office or if the boss is still at their desk, then you absolutely don't leave because you want to be shown that you're actually working. And um, I think we'll come back to this idea of the input versus outcomes in a second, something I hugely believe in, get behind. Um, but I suppose, you know, what, so what's driving people to pretend that they're working is this fear that they have to be perceived as being busy, but what are they actually doing? If they're, if they're spending all of this time pretending to be working, what are they doing instead? Well, they are adding more hours to their work. So they're coming, what they're doing, they're becoming okay. burnout. out. No? So yeah. it's not, I mean, it, instead of having to work eight hours a day, they're working maybe nine hours. So they're okay. adding more hours to their work day. Yeah. 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 By, by essentially pretending that they're so busy and important by creating, you know, by f feeding into Slack channels or by creating additional meetings that are not really that necessary. Is that the kind of thing? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They mm -hmm. want to be perceived as a little bit more important. And it is, it's, I think for me, it's, it's a shift in mentality that needs to happen. We, and I, you know, and I'm, I'm still having spent almost two decades in the corporate world. It's still ingrained in me. It's the hours that you do. It's the nine to five culture and you put in those hours and, and, you know, working for myself, I need to shift that mentality and be like, it's no, it's about what outcomes I'm achieving and how I'm spending that time. So maybe can we talk a little bit more about how to shift that mentality from the, it's all about the hours that you put in to, and, and I'll share an example. I, I'm sure I've shared this before on, um, on the podcast, but it was one that really struck a chord with me where, uh, this is a friend of mine said to me that she was, um, uh, she worked two additional hours, let's say on a Wednesday, and she's and she was thinking to herself, well, it's okay if I knock off two hours early on Friday because I worked two additional hours on Wednesday, you know, and it, again, it's this mentality of the number of hours that you work as opposed to what you have achieved in a day, in a week, in a month, whatever it might be. But how do we start shifting that mentality from the input of the hours, the energy, the time, the, um, you know, whatever else you want the the intellect how do we shift that to the outcomes that we are trying to achieve and and put the focus on what those outcomes are absolutely i think that it started with having clear goals mm. and even though companies have okrs sometimes they miss you no know, because they forget about the okrs and they focus on that one of the shift that we talk a lot with clients is focusing on goals so there's one activity that's really good for teams which is What's your goal of the day as a team or as an individual or both? When I say goal, I'm not talking about the tasks that you're going to uh, do or perform, but focus on one goal per day. What are you trying to accomplish? Not what are you going to do? We're still thinking in terms of to-do list. No, I need to send an email. I need to do it. But in the end, what's the impact that your work is going to create mm -hmm. in the organization? Yeah. It, another element is to stop thinking that everything's urgent. And also thinking that if I don't complete this task today, the world is going to end. So I'm not going to, I'm not by any means encouraging procrastination, but perfectionism, it's as bad as procrastination. So the people that never get to jump into doing things because they're always 
uh, procrastinating and thinking well, I'm going to do it tomorrow, tomorrow, that's not good. But the people that feel the pressure that they need to be perfect and everything needs to accomplish today and right now, it's as bad as that. There are many companies that shifted towards a four day week. It's a good approach. I'm not saying everyone should, but for some companies it might work. And one of the biggest challenges was for them to shift their mindset towards don't feel bad if you couldn't finish something. So once again, what are the critical things that need to be completed today? And what are the things that if we don't do it, nothing's going to happen? I do an activity. I facilitate an activity with teams that are really uh, facing too much workload. And I asked them to identify what are the two or three things that you think that are unnecessary. For example, we need to write a report that only serves the purpose of one manager uh, looking good in front of their prospective manager. Uh, we have a meeting to touch base uh, and we can move that to asynchronous communication and whoever wants to check. So there are many things that people can do. And I tell them, well, start eliminating one thing at a time and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, you eliminate those uh, recurring either meetings or reports or stuff and the work and the outcome doesn't get affected. So we are operating under the fear that if I don't do this, then the work. But so separate what's crucial from what's not necessarily crucial. Mm. And lastly, it's there are two types of work uh, like uh, uh, that we do, which is deep work, work that requires concentration, work that is significant, work that's more strategic and it's going to have a bigger impact. And then there's shallow work. Most organizations, shallow work is uh, having a quick meeting, sending an email, a report, no, daily um, scheduling a meeting, daily minutia that we all spend time. When asked companies across the world, like uh, how much time do you spend on each mode? Most companies are spending close to 70%, most individuals of their day work on a uh, shallow work. Mm -hmm. And actually they should be the other way around. Of course, start with 50-50 as an improvement. But if people don't have time to do significant work, as we always say, they don't have time to do the right thing, but then they have time, they find time in the future to fix all the mistakes because we're always rushing from little things to little things and the big things get either unattended or they're done wrong and then we need to fix them. Love that. Absolutely love that. I want to come back to this idea of goals versus um, tasks, because I think there's a maybe a subtle difference that I want to, so people understand really what the difference is between saying, okay, this is what I want to achieve today. Here's my list of tasks versus having a focus of here's the outcome that I want to achieve today. And maybe the tasks associated with that outcome, you don't necessarily have to do them all to achieve that outcome. So do you want to elaborate a little bit on, on the, the subtle difference between what you're talking about of how to, to kind of look at your day? Yeah, imagine that, for example, you're working on a project, you have an initiative and you need to either get a green light or you need to kill it. Mm. Usually you focus on, oh, I want my manager to approve it or we need to schedule a meeting or we need to work. We focus on all these steps those are the tasks mm. that need to happen. But the outcome is, in the end, we need to get a green light or we need to get a red light and that's yeah. it. Yeah. And that's the goal. No? So that's the outcome that we need to focus on. What are the things that we need to do? If you need to, I don't know, publish um, I don't know, a report for, one of, for, for your company, well, there are a lot of steps that you need to take from coming up with an idea to crafting it, to do the research to share with people, getting feedback, then someone in your company needs to design it. There are a lot of steps, but in the end, your goal is to get it published. Mm. And I think that's where we need to start from. Start from the end, you know, what's the outcome yeah. and not all the steps. And people mm. are still thinking in several steps. Uh, that's, a, that's why we have a lot of little things because we plan from steps rather than think, okay, let's step, what's the ideal outcome and let's, let's redesign, sorry, our work around that i think it's 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 really <clears throat> important subtle difference and really really interesting i think and um, i i want to now just before we wrap things up come back to this idea of the deep work versus the shadow work that's like in some ways 70 percent of our time is in meetings and emails and whatnot in some ways it doesn't really surprise me if we're saying that we want people to kind of have it the other way around and maybe the first step is 50 50 how do we start doing that? I mean, I'm thinking 
you cut down in the number of meetings that you have, you uh, meetings that could be an email or you have rules around communication internally, like no internal emails, it's Slack only, it's, you know, asynchronous is accepted, all of those kind of things. But, you know, any any thoughts on how to make that shift to focus more on, on deep work at work? Absolutely. Um, I think that you mentioned a lot of uh, fixes which are important, but sometimes companies fail to implement those fixes for many reasons. First, because they try to fix too many things at the same time, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. And also because they don't change the mindset. So if yeah. you're still operating, many companies fail to shift towards an uh, asynchronous first because they still think that real time is better, right? When people are forcing now, many leaders try to force their employees back to the office. We hear the, the, the Twitter story and many others. That's based on the assumption that only great quality work can be delivered in the same place, mm. which equals to real uh, real time, so synchronously. And that's a misconception. There's a lot of collaboration that we can do. For example, we can have a kickoff call meeting, whatever you want to call it, to design how we're going to approach and tackle a project, divide and conquer. But then when each person is conquering their own territory, we don't need to continue having meetings. We only meet if there's a problem. The rest can be managed asynchronously. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue. It, many people still think that, for example, brainstormings only and creativity only can happen if you're having people in the same room. There are a lot of great ways to a, a brainstorm a, a, a remotely. And actually, there are, in my experience, and we run thousands, they are much more productive, more efficient, they're more inclusive because introverts and women and minorities get to participate more than when they're loud and someone's taking the lead. It also, it, when it comes to making decisions, many companies have shifted decision making to a synchronous mode. So they create like a document in which someone comes with the, this is the problem, these are my uh, uh, perspective, and then people can chime in and um, present their uh, ideas and their solutions in a written form. So it, it allows for a more educated, civil uh, conversation, but also it allows people to reflect so we don't have to rush in there. So, but once again, it's the mindset that needs to change and it's really, really hard to do that. Some companies like Asana, which is a software company, have taken what they call like a meeting doomsday and they cancel in a couple of teams every meeting. So rather than make tweaks, they say, hey, let's start from scratch. Mm. And I think it builds on this idea from Brian Chesky, a, a Airbnb CEO, when he talked about the, the new reality and Airbnb now has a work from anywhere policy. Mm. He said, if we didn't have an office, at the office as a concept, would we actually invent it in today's world? And if we invented from scratch because it didn't exist, what for? What would we invent the office for? And I think that's the most important thing that leaders need to do. Stop trying to uh, make tweaks really zoom out and try to reset your culture you need to think differently mm -hmm. and leaders are not doing that they're just finding patches fixes for the problems where they say hey we went through a pandemic a, a, a remote work show us that people can work differently we realize that we need to stop creating a wall between our personal and professional lives we know that people want flexibility scale flexibility not just location they want to design how they work well what if we create different rules rather than just implement two or three fixes because the fixes are going to last so long. I like that idea of the fixes versus the new rules of work. Um, and so from based on everything that you're saying, Gustavo, it sounds like it's challenging the existing beliefs that organizations have. So if you believe that work can only be done, going back to your earlier point, in the same place, that you are where someone else is, that causes leaders to say, I mandate you back to the office. I'm making sure that that everyone is coming back to the office so that they can work together. That stems from a belief. And if you are in that situation and you don't share that belief, maybe that's going to drive you to go and look for a, a company where the beliefs are actually shared with your own beliefs. Would that be fair to say? Indeed, it's ingrained in the belief system, but also in the experience. You mentioned the both of us had a couple of decades working in the office, and that's what we know. We had to, for me, it was a realization, not only when I started working on my own, but also the pandemic forced me to rethink my business because I used to do a lot of things in person, and then I found works to do it remotely. And now I do a mix of both, depending on the, the occasion, the needs. 
And, and, and that's something very interesting. When I started interviewing people for my book, I realized that those who are thriving in this new reality, either because they work remote first from the beginning or they shift from a in-person to a more hybrid environment, were people who were willing to understand, hey, this is not just a hiatus. The pandemic wasn't just a, hey, we pause and now we go back to normal. They realized that it accelerated things that were happening. We've been living with technology. There are many things that we can do that we don't need to be in the same place and we can be as effective. So I think that to your point, we need to change our belief systems. Mm. So the things that we, the thing, the culture that got you here is not going to get you there and you can stretch it so far, but it's going to be too late. I think that the people that are open-minded, they're experimenting, you know, they are getting better results, but actually, for example, Spotify, people talk a lot about the the Twitter and Elon Musk being super uh, top down and people need to get back to the office. But few people are speaking about Spotify or Airbnb. They're getting fantastic results with their working from anywhere mm -hmm. culture. One thing that from me, not only Spotify is getting better performance, less attrition, but one data that is super, super fantastic. The women in leadership position at Spotify in the past 18 months have risen from 25 to 40%. So wow. now four out of 10 leadership positions at Spotify are occupied by women. That's fantastic. We all talk about diversity. Well, hello, if you want to increase diversity, offer flexible work, not mm -hmm. flexible in terms of work, to, but hybrid provides women more opportunities, not only to work, but actually to lead. And that's why we need more women leading companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. You won't get any Sorry arguments pitch, from me. But I, <laughs> I get, I get like, <laughs> yeah, I get very passionate about these kind of things as well. Um, <laughs> Gustavo, is there anything that we haven't covered on the podcast today that you kind of want to make a point about? I mean, I could talk, I, I'm very passionate about the topic, so I don't want to <laughs> steal more people's time. No, I mean, there are many things uh, and, and of course people can reach out and we can continue the conversation. Uh, one thing that I would maybe to summarize, I talk about experimentation, this is critical. Uh, leaders need to understand that they own the final word when it comes to defining the culture. They own the culture in the responsibility, meaning of the ownership, side so in the end if the culture is broken you are the first person who should take action you are the first person as a leader who should feel accountable but owning the culture is everyone's job in terms of making sure that we have a great culture so leaders have a key role but the culture of the company is not the result of what leaders do it's the result of everyone's behavior so if i'm a great leader but i have employees that are treating my customers really bad and I don't do anything about it. Well, the people are creating about culture too. So invite your people. Culture should be co-created because the way people behave shapes your culture. So don't think that because you write a nice uh, list of values or behaviors that you expect from your people that you have a good culture. And also don't write those without involving people in the process. I'm not saying go democratic. I'm not saying hey, everyone should have a saying or everyone should go to vote, but mm. get input. Invite yeah. people to the conversation. There are many companies I mentioned Airbnb. They refreshed their values a couple of years ago and they invited everyone to have a saying, hey, what drives our culture? What inflates, what deflates our culture? And they took that feedback to revisit their values. Because yeah, yeah. if values don't resonate with people, they're not going to mean anyone anything to anyone. Exactly. And I, I've been in organizations where the values were fairly meaningless. They weren't anything to do with my day-to-day -day experience of the organization whatsoever so i can definitely um i can definitely relate from that perspective and and, and it is everyone and like to me what's rang to mind when you were talking about that is it's the it's it's what gets tolerated so if there's bad behavior happening and we kind of talked about that earlier <clears throat> excuse me if there's bad behavior happening but leaders aren't stepping in to do anything about it it means that that bad behavior is being tolerated and it's being accepted and it's being shown as it's okay to do this here when actually it's not because leaders need to be empowered to have those sometimes very difficult conversations about this kind of behavior is not accepted here absolutely we talk about behaviors we reward and punish and sometimes we reward the wrong behavior so mm -hmm. you need to be mindful about that the, uh, there's a company that a couple because it happened with two companies in a row that we're working with that we basically found out that uh, people who are high uh, low sorry low performers 
were given a pass, a free pass. So basically no one was doing nothing about them. Mm -hmm. However, they were, so they were being rewarded for not working as much as the rest. However, the companies in, in these examples, they were punishing their high performers because they have to work even more to upset the work that their team members weren't taking care of. Mm. That's really interesting. I think that happens a lot. You know, a lot of what I see in organizations is that if you perform well, you get given more work, which, you know, it's, you might think this is great and I'm getting the visibility, but it, the result is that people who perform really well end up burning out. And then you have mm -hmm. the people who are kind of coasting in the team and no one's actually doing anything about that because, e <laughs> excuse me, either they don't realize or they're not having those tough conversations. Absolutely. Yeah, good point. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so, um, so Gustavo, the question I ask everyone who comes on the podcast, what does being happier at work mean to you? That's a great a question. And I don't want to challenge the spirit. I'm going to start with a thought that first of all, we need to, my principle, my philosophy about happiness, happening, happiness, is something that happens inside. Mm. So it's not something that can be provided. No, when people say we need to create a happy workplace, mm. a happiness is not what you get, but be, because you can give people more and more and they're never going to be happy and people can be happy with fewer things. Yeah. So I think happen, happy, happiness is an internal decision. It's mm -hmm. accepting what you have rather than wanting more and, and enjoying what you have. It, but however, I would say that the role of organizations is to make sure that they're not adding unhappiness. No? So remove those speed bumps, the things that are creating unnecessary friction that are frustrating your people. So don't try to create a culture that pleases people to make them happy and give them more and more because you're never going to please them and actually you're going to lose the sense. Culture is not just about making people feel good. It's about making sure that people can do a great work and they enjoy and they want to show up at work. However, don't remove unhappiness. So for me, that's my, my personal. So what are the things that are making people unhappy, frustrated, mm. working longer hours, getting in the way of them? You know, if there's something that are complicating their lives for the sake of it, get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. No, I absolutely love that. And um, really interesting and valid point about uh, people pleasing versus creating that culture where people can thrive and do their best work. So sometimes we default to making sure that people are uh, pleased or by doing things that we think will make them happy when it doesn't actually make them happy. What you really want is to create that culture where they can succeed on, on their terms and, and bring their best selves to work. Yeah, I always think like we need to shift from people first to people centered or mm. people centric. So people first is a shift from I don't care about the employees to oh, whatever the employees want, we're going to do it. And I think that the culture should just serve the employees. You need to serve the business, you need to serve the customers, you need to serve everyone. So people centric is considering people's need and making sure that whatever benefits you can bring to the table to make their lives easier from health benefits to maternity leave to whatever to a flexible working hours or location or schedule, bring it on, but not just to please people, just to show them I care about you and I want to help make sure, because in the end, cultures are helping people do their best work. Mm -hmm. And where people don't have a, a, a issues that get in the way, then they can do their best work. They're going to be happy because of that and they're going to be engaged as a consequence. I'm going to repeat your that for the masses because I, I love that I just jotted it down culture is about helping people to do their best work and I think that really summarizes everything that we've talked about today so thank you I really appreciate that if people want to reach out if they want to connect if they, we didn't even touch on your book but if they want to learn more about your book what's the best place that they can do that the book is available in many online retailers um, like Amazon and so on and so forth it's called Remote Not Distant, so it's easy to find a, a, in, in many retailers like Barnes & Nobles, Target, Walmart, etc. And if they want to reach out to me, a, they can connect via LinkedIn. I'm the only Gustavo Razzetti with two Z and two T, so that's a double, T, double C, double T, that's easy to find. And also through our website, it's a fearlessculture.design dot design not dot com so make sure you have fearless culture dot design and if you want to learn more about what we do there's a lot of stuff there if you want to use our tools you can we have over 600 articles and different free tools that you can implement with your teams to build better cultures 
And if you want to join some of our workshops or session, look, you it, there. You can just register on our website. We do a culture design masterclass. We also have a, 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 a session program, which is build a fearless culture. And of course, we do consulting with teams and companies. So whatever you want to do, feel free to visit our website, fearlessculture.design. Brilliant. Love that. Thank you so much for your time today, Gustavo. As always, you know, absolute pleasure to, to chat with you. So really, really enjoy the conversation today. Thank you. No, likewise, and I love the, the interaction and the spontaneity of our questions. For the audience, we didn't prepare the question. We just make it happen. And <laughs> yeah. I think it went really good. I appreciate very, it. I'm, I'm, yeah, <laughs> very, very conversational. honored to be here in your show. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very conversational. You know, people have commented in the past saying it's like having a coffee or listening in on a couple of people having coffee, discussing things that are really important to creating happier working environments. So, yeah, really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. My pleasure.